if you're really meant to do this, because this is a business where you have to have certain skills and、uh, traits to be able to be- become successful. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you smash that like button and click subscribe. For those of you listening on a podcast platform, be sure to subscribe on whatever platform that is and leave us a rating if you can. The more likes, ratings, and subscriptions that we get, the more we can spread the message and grow our community. So we also have a free Facebook group. It's called the Average Joe Finances Network. Check us out. Join the group. Join the community. Ask questions and become a part of the team. All of our other social media accounts are listed in our flow page, and we have them in the video or podcast description below. Hey, how's it going, everybody? So today's guest is Charlotte Dunford, and she's the managing partner of Johns Creek Capital. Charlotte brings a unique perspective to mobile home park investing, as she comes from humble beginnings, being a first-generation American citizen and college graduate. After leaving China with just her belongings at the age of 16, she came a long way to now owning over 22 mobile home parks. Today, she shares her journey as well as her processes for finding trailer park deals, property management, and her tips for passive investors. Charlotte has great insights for anyone interested in investing in mobile home parks, and Johns Creek Capital is an investment management company which focuses on mobile home park assets. They currently have over 4.2 million million dollars worth of total investor subscriptions, and currently own 22 mobile home park investments. So, Charlotte, awesome background. Really excited to talk with you today. Thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. All right, right on. So, I, I want to start this off the same way I start every episode, and I gave a brief description about you and your background. But if you could go into a little bit more detail and tell us your story, how did this all get started? So, after I came to the United States, sixteen for high school, I stayed with a host family locally in Pennsylvania for a short period of time until I got into college here in Georgia, one of the top engineering schools here in the South at Georgia Tech.、Um, And then after, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Have always been I- extremely interested in business. So I、uh, studied business at Georgia Tech with a and graduated with a Bachelor of Science、uh, degree in business administration with a focus on technology management. And after graduation, just like a lot of my friends in college, I started a job at a、uh, local technology company here in Alpharetta as a data analyst and business analyst. That's the first job right after college. But you put my Analytical skills to work, but shortly after that, I started doing real estate deals on the side. I used my little、uh, salary, right out of、uh, fresh out of college salary, to finance my first single family home. I bought a single family home in South of Atlanta. It was a lot of is a big learning curve, and it was but it was well worth it. And the second one, I started doing the second deal, which was a duplex,、uh, which turned out to be a really good deal. And then the story kind of you know. Rolled on there, and after about a year and a half of working in corporate, I decided that I was I wanted to pursue my entrepreneur dream. So I just made a jump, took a pretty pretty big risk, but it was a calculated risk and educated risk. As I would, I remember I had a pretty big commute every single day to and from work, three hours in in total every single day. So that's almost like a Part time job. If you calculate the five days a week, you know, fifteen hours just on the road. So during those fifteen hours, I would be reading and listening to books, podcasts, and anything real estate or business related, just honing my skills in real estate. Apart, on top of that, with my、uh, single family home and duplex actual management investment. Experience so that really helped me prepare to take the jump. The reason I said it was a big jump is because my husband at the time was still in college; he was a student, so he didn't have a job, he didn't have an income. I, the little money I saved and the four hundred one k I had for my one point five years of working was really nothing to live on, let alone launch a venture. But I decided that I really did 
I had a confidence that I had, um, I do possess what, what it takes to do this business and the certain skills and just traits that I have in negotiating, making deals and perseverance really to uh, make this a reality. So I took the job. After I quit my job, I got my first mobile home park in August of 2019. The reason I decided to go mobile home park even got my attention is because I'm a firm believer in the blue ocean strategy, meaning that escaping competition is really the only way to win because you can't have that many players in a market to share a healthy return. So I decided to do something that not everybody was pursuing. Mobile Home Park in 2019, when I started, was really an ignored section. Everybody was into single family homes. Everybody knew how to flip a house. Everybody knew how to do, everybody was pursuing multifamily and the cap rate was just so compressed in those sectors to make sense of much of it. So I couldn't get into multifamily because of the competition of it, but I found Mobile Home Park. And that really became the Pandora's box for me. And I just, magic happened after I found this niche where not anybody was pursuing. There was really a vacuum in the market at the time for people like me to go into. So that's why I chose mobile home parks. And within the mobile home park sector, I went with the smaller to medium-sized mobile home parks because most you know, institutionalized investors like banks and Wall Street investors, they wanted to go into mobile home parks with 100 lots, 200 lots. 300 laws and above, tens of millions of dollars. But the sizes that I go with, it can range from anywhere from five laws to 30 laws, 40 laws. So those are smaller ones. And that creates a different niche. So this niche within a niche really provided me with the opportunity to make excellent, beyond excellent deals because they're not extremely heated yet. Though right now in 2021 and 2020, those the investor interest really grew, which you know, brought up the prices, which um, means that the deals that I made in the last year were really grew in value. So fast forward to today, I we have 22 parks under management. We acquired 22 parks and uh, two that's closing in a couple of weeks and then much more to come in 2022. That that is super awesome. What what a great way to get started. You initially started off your investing journey by buying a single family home, then you went to the duplex, but you were looking to get into something, you know, even grander than that. And that's when you started looking right. at home park investing. So fast forward to where you were at in August of 2019. What was it? How did you find that first deal and how big was this lot for your first? So the first one that I bought was in, in my home state of Georgia, where I, I, I searched for this deal through a broker located locally in the south of Georgia, South Georgia. It's actually a pretty good opportunity because I, I, I got this deal. I got the OM and I did some research into it. And uh, we actually negotiated a seller financing deal with, I think, five percent interest rate. I think it's four percent, five percent interest rate, uh, a 30 year amortization, a 10 year balloon. So that's with I think 30 only 30 to 30 percent down, which is a very good deal. Yeah, that's fantastic numbers right there. Right. Awesome. And it was next to a power plant, which gave us a deal of lease for tenants. And there is a waiting list for every single home there just because the job opportunity is only 10 minutes away from this large employer that employs you know, thousands of people. Yeah, yeah. So was how big was this lot, this first one? That, that was 30 lots. A lot oh, of them. Okay. There, yeah, it, it, it was actually, there's a high vacancy. The actual occupied ones was like 10, but the numbers still work great. So that's uh, for the first one, I think it was, it, it turned out, so we still hold that one as making pretty good money for us and pretty good returns. Yeah, awesome. So when you, when you went into that one, right, you had 10 out of 30 units occupied. Uh, now, one of the things I wanted to ask, were these mobile homes rented or were they owned by the, uh, by the people living in them and you were renting out the lot? Right. It was a mix. So, okay. you know, the, the ultimate goal of a mobile home park is to transition from park-owned homes to tenant-owned homes. So mm -hmm. we don't want to own them. We're in the parking lot business, not in the park-owned home business. The uniqueness about this particular park is that it does have a great migrant worker uh, population locally to wanting to uh, rent a home, and there is a housing shortage, extreme housing shortage locally. So uh, that's why we decided to rent them out because there's still great business there. But once this migrant worker wave, if it ends at all, we're tr we'll be trying to sell them on a grant credit program. So the ideal 
uh, place to have all tenant owned homes. And speaking of vacancy, most of our parks don't have this level of vacancy. That's the first one. And because of opportunities and good numbers, the vacancy was made sense, the risk that we're willing to take. But for now, most of the parks are 80 to 95% occupied. Okay, okay, perfect. So now going into this, you take down this first deal how did you know how did you go from there to scale now did did you do this first one by yourself or did you go in with partners like how did that work yeah the first one was with partners i had investors going into it as far okay. as scaling just like scaling any business attracting new investors new customers was key and just like scaling anything we just kept on doing deals delivering good results getting referrals and then the business pretty much bloomed from there awesome awesome okay so now from August 2019 to now, you've acquired over 22 and you have two hopefully closing here shortly. That is, that's quite a bit to do in just a, a two-year span. So one, I want to say, fantastic job. That's awesome. But to go from where you were at when you first started to where you're at now, that's just, you definitely can tell that you put in the effort and you put in the work. So mm -hmm. what is it that you enjoy the most about going into this asset class and just taking down mobile home parks instead of, let's say, like an apartment building. What what made you, I know you wanted to niche down into something that was less competitive, but what is it that, that you enjoy the most about it? I think what I enjoy the most about it was, first of all, I was able to do deals at, at a good cap rate. All of our deals last year were acquiring at nine per cap rate and above, and many of them above 10%, which is really unheard of in the apartment sector. And for someone at the time when I started the business, I was young and, and experienced and in the seller financing. And then I would say at the time, apartment building was already saturated with many competitors and experienced investors. So there was really not a possibility for me to compete with them. The only chance I had was to go into a niche not many people were, were into at the time yet. So that's pretty much the primary reason um, that is because I was able to do deals. And as I got more and more into the mobile home park space, I was able to understand how this sector works and understanding that there is a big housing crisis in our country currently. And a uh, this is the part of the solution that solves the cri of housing crisis. I think, you know, the affordable housing for good, hardworking Americans, that really brings joy. And I think that's, that gives us as a meaning to the work. Yeah. So it's something bigger than yourself, right? Because you're able to provide housing for people and help people that are in unique situations, right? They're, they're coming here, they're trying to find a place to live. And there's not many places available that's affordable. So you're, right. you're providing a, an affordable housing option for many of the, like you said, many of the migrant workers that are coming over and just trying to make a living for themselves. So that's right. really awesome. And when you look at it from that perspective, that, that top down, that broader range, it just gives you like a better feeling on the inside that you're doing something that's helping the community and helping other people. Besides doing this to put money in your pocket, you're actually making a positive impact for others. What a, yeah. Yeah. What a beautiful perspective to have, right? That's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Now, besides mobile home parks, we're talking about Charlotte now. Is there anything else in particular uh, or other asset classes that you personally invest? Right now, my, my trade is mobile home parks. And for each single, for all of our deals under Johns Creek Capital, as the general partner, we always put in our own capital. So a majority of my own investments are in, in the mobile home park sector. And another interest I, that I have is maybe the storage building. I, I think I'm a fan of all the ignored sector. So I think that's something that I, I'm interested in as well. So yeah, I, I do, because of this business, I do read up a lot and research a lot on different products, different financial products in, in the market. Why would people invest in this thing? So everything has its pros and cons. It just depends on each investor's interests and their risk tolerance, really. Yeah, perfect. Perfect. So you, you had mentioned self-storage. Is that something that you're looking into to possibly uh, get into in the future? Absolutely, yes. So we are, as the philosophy of Johns Creek Capital is to have, to go into spaces where it's not overly crowded because we're in the business to make money. And for our investors, we, we have to deliver a certain levels of return. So that's important to us. So we have to buy cautiously and buy at a rate where things make sense. And when it gets right. to a certain point in other asset classes, it just doesn't make sense anymore. So any asset class really that the profit margin for us to take, then I think that we'll be interested. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, perfect. It's one thing to to be investing in certain areas where you're helping other people out, but it's also another thing to make sure you're keeping everybody happy, aka your investors, right? You want to make sure that they're happy and that they're going to keep coming back to to help fund future investments. So that's definitely important. So um, very happy to hear that you and Johns Creek Capital like really do your due diligence and research on any asset before you just jump in, because that's one of the things you definitely have to be careful because it's, it's other people's money at this point. So that's, uh, that's definitely awesome. Okay. Right. Definitely. Yep. Right on. So now for you, you, you migrated here from China, right? At the age of 16 with mm -hmm. just the clothes on your back and, and some belongings as we talked Correct, about yeah. in your background. Now, mm -hmm. when you came here, what was like the first steps you got here, then you went to school and I know you said you, you went to college and mm -hmm. then from there, while you were in college, you started, you actually, your first job uh, was as a data and business analyst. Mm -hmm. You started taking the money from that and I'm rewinding back a bit, but you started taking the money from, from that, like from your job, putting it to the side to invest and buy this first single family rental and then that duplex. What, what made you to like decide to just jump into real estate while you were working at a job, making a decent income, right? Cause that's a pretty decent income paying job, but what made mm -hmm. you want to start investing into uh, real estate versus going the traditional route of like a 401k, which I know you said you had stuff in that as well. So what made you take that leap? So as you can tell from my personal experience, I am not a person to follow anything traditional, really. So a traditional person or a normal person doesn't just pack her bags and say goodbye to mom and dad at age 16 and jump on a plane to America. That doesn't happen with a normal person. So so when I was uh, working as a business analyst, of course, the traditional route wouldn't really make me happy, wouldn't really not. I'm just not someone who would take the traditional route. So with that said the reason why I particularly was interested in mobile sorry uh, real estate was because growing up in China a communist regime where you as a citizen you cannot legally own any real estate you lease it from the government for 70 years of your own apartment and you have to give it back or you have to extend the lease people do not really have any private property to their name I've always fascinated with the idea of owning your own property in the in the United States you can actually make that make that a reality you own every single piece on your property that you purchase so that idea really always you know fascinated me that i've always wanted to do something like that so that's why uh, i think uh, real estate is a important you know important part of you know uh, our business and i think another thing being chinese we have really heavy family values and a home a property a house apartment whatever it is somewhere to call home is always uh, the, the most important thing in a chinese person life people that i grew up around with anyways my family my, my parents always extremely a heavy value on property and real estate even though they don't own it but they still are gladly living in there so i think that those two important factors and then my, you wouldn't call it rebellious, but non-traditional approach in life really, you know, contributed to why I'm doing what I am, what I'm doing today. Fantastic. Yeah. So one of the things I wrote down as you were talking about that is you have to be a not normal person. <laughs> and I don't mean that in a bad way. The way you were explaining everything is you didn't follow the traditional route. And, and then when you came here to the United States, it wasn't like, hey, I'm going to follow the traditional route that they do here in the U.S. and I'm going to go this route, work my job until 65 and then cash mm -hmm. out my 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 IRA or my 401k and, and be able to retire at, at yeah. you know, 65. No, you said, yeah. hey, I packed up my bags at 16 to come here and start this whole new journey because I'm, quote unquote, not a normal person and I'm not going to follow the traditional route. Mm -hmm. So you came here mm -hmm. and said, hey, there's more opportunity here if I continue down this path of not going the traditional route. So mm -hmm. I'm going to continue doing that. Mm -hmm. And you did, right. which is fantastic. That's one of the things I guess the big takeaway I want to take from this is that you can't really build your wealth quickly if you're going to go the traditional or just the normal route that everyone else goes that, hey, everybody says, hey, if you do it this way and you play it safe, that you're going to you're gonna be okay at the age of you know 65. Not everybody wants to retire at 65. Some people want to live their life a little bit. They want to retire mm -hmm. maybe in their 40s or late 30s. And it's very mm -hmm. possible. It just depends on how much risk you're willing to take and mm -hmm. how much effort you're going to put in to do that. And the amazing thing is when I listen to your story 
is you came here to the States and you went all in. It wasn't just, oh, I, I think I might do this. No, you came here and said, I'm making moves and this is what's going to happen. So that is right. just pretty awesome. That's the big takeaway that I, I get from what you're doing. So uh, definitely want to say amazing. Now, thank you. You're welcome. You're most welcome. Now, the other thing that you did that I thought was very fascinating is when you started investing in real estate to go out to all these different places, your commute, you said was over three hours. And during right. this three hour period, you were reading books and listening to podcasts. Now you were taking public transportation if you were reading, right? You weren't like driving your car and, and no, and yeah, public book. transportation. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, I would say, hey, that's dangerous. And I wouldn't recommend that if anybody <laughs> listens to the show, don't try to read a book while you're driving. No. I've seen people on the highway doing that and it scares the crap out of me every time. Oh yeah. I, I don't yeah, know don't why. Do Just get the ebook and listen to it. Exactly. <laughs> but anyway, exactly. no, that's awesome. So you were reading books, listening to podcasts, listening to to ebooks as well, and just taking on and absorbing all of this information and this knowledge, you basically turned yourself right. into a content sponge and just absorbing as much as you can. So that's another key takeaway from this is you don't want to just jump into real estate or jump into mobile home park investing, particularly without doing some type of research and your own due diligence. Because if you don't do those things and you jump in on your own, it's just like going into the stock market into a risky stock that you did no research on or going into cryptocurrencies and going all in on like Dogecoin or something, and then you lose all your money. So right, uh, then the you're not you're not investing. You're speculating. Most people right, are not investors. Right. They're speculators. Yeah, exactly. So the key thing to being an investor and being a good investor is actually doing your research. And now it. That also goes with if you're going to invest with a company as a passive investor. I know when we talked about your background, right, you talk about that you have tips for passive investors, and I'd like to get into that. But before we do, for passive investors, which I'm a passive investor right now in, in a syndication, and the big thing for me when I went into that was knowing and researching the company I was going with. I had to make yeah. sure I was very comfortable and that the information they were feeding me was accurate and that the returns and, and everything else, the preferred return, everything that they really did their due diligence and they did an amazing job. And that made me comfortable as an investor to, to go in. So I think that's absolutely super important. So I'd like to get into that. What are some tips that you have for a passive investor that would maybe want to go with your company or another another company that they're just getting into it and they have some cash and they want to invest it into a mobile home asset class. So how, what would you recommend to them? Yeah, I agree with you. I think the most important thing is to vet the sponsors to make sure you, you understand who you're going into business with. Because at the end of the day, the deal, anybody can make any deal, but the importance is who you're going into business with. And if this deal is solid, are your sponsors solid? Because bad sponsors can turn a good deal bad and a good, good sponsors can make good bad deals good. So I, you really want to make sure that you understand. It's like any investor, any spot, just like any investor, you want to understand the company that you're going with. Just if you're going to invest in a stock, you, you want to make sure that is this company, how, how did it do last quarter or what, what are people saying about them? And it just, just do your due diligence. You have to understand what you're investing in. You're buying a product. You better know what the product is offering you and the, the history of it. Exactly. It's the same thing like it, it, when you treat it like a product, right? Like you said, anything that you would purchase for people that pay attention to what they eat, right? especially if you're like one of those organic uh, food people, what's the one of the biggest right. things that you look at before you purchase any type of food product? The ingredients. Right. You want to look right. at, make sure that there's none of this and none of that or anything. So exactly. And if a food product had a series of food poisoning cases, mm -hmm. you probably don't want to go there. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. it, it, and it gives you like a, a better investment on your own body, right? Because you're mm -hmm. investing in your own personal health when you're doing that. Somebody looking at what they're putting into their body, they're going to do their research on that. So why not do the same type of research with something you're going to put your money in? Exactly. Because listen, if you're going to invest your money into something with somebody, you better make sure you know who and what you're getting involved with because you worked hard for that money. You don't want it to just disappear. Right. Exactly. Now, some people you, you could spend frivolously on things, which I know I have on many times in the past. And mm -hmm. sometimes you buy something because you think you want it or need it. And then it turns out it was just a waste of money. And you could do the same thing with an investor. Right. You can say, hey, I really want this because I want to be involved in A, B, C or D. 
and mm-hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to dump 25,000 or $50,000 into this because I want to be a part of this team and a part of this deal, but you didn't research them that that could spell bad news for you in the future. You might get lucky, but you might right. not. So definitely do your due diligence. So, all right. Absolutely. Fantastic. Now, besides the tips for passive investors, what do you have any tips or tricks for somebody that may want to get started in real estate just in general, like a brand new baby, they just got out of debt or somebody in a similar situation to you, they moved to the United States looking for something new and fresh and they want to get started in real estate. What would you recommend to somebody coming over here right now or just getting? In my shoes, it it took me, I think, it took me over 10 years to become an American citizen. So first of all, you have to, you want to make sure you have the legal to to, to conduct business in the United States. You cannot just come over here and do your thing. That would be illegal. So absolutely, we we must respect all laws in the United States. And that's what makes our country great, make our society great. And that the American culture and society wars honesty and uh, law-abiding citizens. So that's number one. And number two, if you are brand new and you've been here and you want to start your own thing, I would say first thing is to really uh, have an education to understand how things work because without knowledge you don't have any and, and you don't even know how to acquire deals and you can learn as you go but you have to have some sort of basic understanding of business and real estate in general and the number three I would say is to have confidence in yourself and really have a self-assessment to understand if you're really meant to do this because this is a business where you have to have certain skills and uh, traits to be able to be- become successful in this business. So those are the three things I would recommend for sure. Yeah, I love that. I love that. Especially that last one, have confidence in yourself. That's huge, right? right. If you're going into this half fully invested or not fully invested, but like half invested instead of being fully vested in this, then you could be setting yourself up for failure. So absolutely. Right. Now I have another question I want to ask you because you were, you were doing this three hour commute and you were listening to books, reading books and listening to podcasts. Do you have a favorite business investing or real estate related book and or podcast? So my favorite book of all time is called From Zero to One by Peter Thiel. He is a Silicon Valley investor, co-founder of PayPal, uh, works alongside with Elon Musk in the earlier um, you know, periods of PayPal. And he has so many really successful businesses, one of the most successful Silicon Valley investors uh, out there. And yeah, his philosophy of from zero to one really talks about that there's only one reason businesses fail is because they fail to escape competition. And that really, that philosophy really resonated with me and is pretty much how I conduct my business. Yes, that's fantastic. That sounds like a great book. I have not read that, but I'm adding it to my list. Mm-hmm. Definitely sounds awesome. All right. So Charlotte, now we've had a great conversation about your journey, what you're doing and and how people can get into this, right? Now, people might want to know a little bit more about you or find out more information about you and Johns Creek Capital. So where can people do that? Where can people find more information about you and your team? Uh, do you have a website or social media uh, pages that they can follow? Yeah, absolutely. The best way to get in touch with me is to go to our website at johnscreekcapital.com and uh, click on the contact us and fill out the form. And I'll be right in touch. All right. That's easy enough. So for those of you listening right now, uh, don't try to write that down if you're driving, but we'll make sure that link is in the show notes and that you can find uh, any additional information that you need on Charlotte. And Charlotte, I, this has been an absolute absolutely fun interview. You have an amazing journey just talking about from where you started in the beginning to where you're at now. I'm wishing you the best of luck. By the time this episode airs, those other two deals would have closed. So Mm -hmm. congratulations on all that and congratulations on all of your success. It was definitely a pleasure speaking with you today. Same here. Thank you very much. All right on. Aloha. Thank you for making it to the end of this episode. Greatly appreciate you being here with me today on the Average Joe Finances podcast. If you haven't done so yet, make this the episode that you go leave us a five-star rating or subscribe to our YouTube channel. The Average Joe Finances podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only. Have an outstanding day. Mm